Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So welcome back to this lecture on long term memory and in the last lecture we looked at what is long term memory, how it is stored, what is its format and what is the forgetting that it uh, happens or how does the forgetting happen from long term memory and we looked at several forgetting theories like decay theory, the theory of uh, in, in improper encoding, the interference theory and so on and so forth. So continuing from there, uh, the last thing that we did in the last uh, lecture was how does uh, retrieval really work and uh, so this retrieval failures how does it really process and so one thing which you are seeing is uh, in terms of retrieval queue failure. So, if an improper retrieval queue is used how does forgetting suffer. So, how do we make this happens really um, uh, improve this retrieval queue and so what retrieval queue works the best. So, what is the way in which we can improve this retrieval queue kind of a system. So, one of the things in which can help people to learn to remember back from long term memory is something called the encoding specificity principle and basically queues that uh, whatever uh, way in whatever format you remembered in whatever way you remembered if I have the same context back in whatever context you, uh, people remember if I br bring the same context back people tend to remember more. Now, think of when you are giving an exam what you tend to remember is in which page the answer was there, what was the page like, what was drawn on top of the page everything comes to mind but the answer does not come to mind and so if people are tested where they learn back the chances are that the context because this context serve as additional queue. So, let us say if this is the queue which is connected to my target there are several other queues from the environment which are present when I am learning it. For example, the atmosphere which is there, the kind of noise which was happening, the state that you were there in uh, the num amount of the type of people which are present when you are learning and so when you are remembering it back all these additional cues, all these additional features will also help you in recalling back things or recalling back the answer and so this is what is called the encoding uh, principle. So, if the context this is what the context looks like, if the context is the same here then people tend to remember back and so let us look at what encoding specificity principle basically tells us. So, in encoding specificity principle you have two different types one is the context dependent mem uh, memory. So, improve ability to remember if tested in the same environment as the initial learning. So, in the if people are uh, learn in a particular environment in uh, let us say they will learn in a library if they test you back if I test you back in a library it is much better if I if I make you read something in a classroom and test you back onto the classroom the other features of the classroom where you sat the kind of uh, seat that you sat in the kind of people that were uh, there with you all these will help you in more retrieval because the number of retrieval queues will increase and so number of retrieval queues will increase which means that the chances of recognition increases as each queue has a weight and so the added weight will increase the efficiency of queuing. So, better recall if tested in a classroom where you initially learn uh, then you went to move to a new classroom or if learning room smells of chocolate or moth ball people are better to remember if that if the chocolate smell or the chocolate uh, moth ball smell is same. So, compared to different smell for no reason. Now, another context effect that is popular in most researchers in psychology and particularly the kind of research that I do is basically called time effect. So, basically I work in something called sleep and memory and so one of the things that we have look, look into is the chronological cycle the basically the ultra then and the, the, uh, the, the rhythms the chronological rhythm that people have. Uh, so, people have this set rhythms that are ups and downs which are there and so uh, in within days the system the human metabolism goes up and down. So, at uh, for example, at 2 o'clock in the morning 2 to 3 the, there is a dip in this rhythm the chronological uh, the chronobiological rhythm which is there. So, 
uh, that is what we have to take care of when we are testing people or when we are uh, doing psychological experiments. Because if you learn in a high in a in a high metabolic state and if you learn retrieve it back in a low metabolic state, you will have differences. So, we have to think about that and so this is another factor which you have to think about. So, time of the day is also important. Let us say that if we remember something learn at 3 pm and then uh, <laughs> it is better to perform that at 3 pm than in 9 pm because 3 pm is the first nadir is the first dip that is there in in your uh, biological cycle and at 3 pm the uh, metabolic rate or the metabolic um, system is at a very low rate and so if learned at this metabolic rate remembering uh, back at that metabolic rate is uh, much better than remembering at any other metabolic rate when it is at 9 pm so an experiment was done with divers to find out whether this works or not and so the divers may be <laughs> to learn a particular kind of a list. So, list of words were given to people who dived under water and so they learnt the list on land and on water and they again so divers were used there were two kind of divers one who was sitting on uh, the water over the water and one under the water and they learned lists over the water and under the water and later on a retrieval was done the travel was done both on land and under water. And so, what happened is those divers who learned list under water the retrieval was better under water and for those divers who learned list over water on land their performance was better on land. And so, that is what you see water land, land water, water water, land land in both these cases the performances are better than. So, these are always better than the performance here. So, words under, heard under water are better recalled under water and words und, uh, heard under land are better recalled under land. Now, with context effect you also have in the encoding specificity you also have something called state dependent features. So, basically improved recall uh, uh, related to internal physiology or emotional state. Contact dependent effect ex, uh, environmental factors and state dependent uh, effect depend on the internal physiology. So, what is the body physiology when you are remembering something when you are recalling something that also has a lot to say about how recall really progresses. So, what you are trying to uh, achieve or what is your body physiology will actually also support your retrieval. And so, for example, moods or emotions have a lot to think. So, if, if you are negatively emotion or if you are feeling negative when you are learning a list and then we are trying to retrieve back this list, if at this point of time you are still feeling uh, that negativity, this will lead you to learn better. So, people who learn under uh, certain emotionality uh, when they retrieve it back that happens or for people who uh, it is better or people who learn under certain mood retrieving it back under the same mood is better. So, bipolar depressives information learned and so in experiments were done on bipolar depressive it was found out that informations which people learned these people learned under the manic state they when they try to uh, test it under manic state the, uh, the important the uh, recall was better than when tested under depressed. So, these many depressive people go under phases. So, this is the kind of phase this is called the mania phase where they are hyperactive and this is the depression phase where they are not uh, where they are very depressed. So, no kind of activity again mania and negative depression. So, they, this is called bipolar disorder they keep on switching between mania and depression. So, once once they are very excited if they learn something when they are very excited and they try to remember this when they are depressed does not work. So, recall is poor. <coughs> so, if you are drunk when you are learning something and you recall better if drunk then and under sober. So, basically uh, uh, would not suggest that, but then if you if your metabolic state is having alcohol if you have heightened alcoholic content or your metabolic state is such that it supports alcohol uh, intake and if you learn something there then recall is better when you are drunk than when you are sober because this is where it was encoded and this is how it should be. Made. Another feature or another effect which promotes recall is called the spacing effect. What does it say? So, better to study for short periods of time than for one long period of time. So, if there is a list of item that you have to remember or if there is a number of items that you have to remember it is better to space it off which basically means that break it off. So, what you tend to do is if you are learning a lesson what you tend to do is break that lesson into several parts. Remember these lessons into parts learn this lesson into parts which is called the uh, spacing 
effect and so Ebengos also tested this is called the mass practice versus space practice kind of a uh, uh, arrangement. In mass practice Ebengos tried to learn the whole list in one go. So, 100 lists with 100 words each in one go and so it was not uh, easy to do, but what he did was when he tried to learn only one list take a break again take another list and learn it was much better and this is called the spacing effect. So, in spacing effect what you tend to do is take the whole section or whole chapter which you are learning break it into its smaller parts and then start learning with it and then I think that is a good idea to learn that is uh, to learn uh, to better learn something. So, 1 hour per day for 8 days leads to better recall than 8 hours of cramming in one day and so this is what I see most students doing just before the exam what they tend to do is that they start cramming or they start uh, losing their sleep over and so they go into this 4 or 5 hours of learning everything and then coming back and then there is a failure. Why is a failure? Because spacing something gives you enough time for the neurons to basically recuperate back to basically regenerate back and so they can store more information. But then if you keep on exciting a neuron over a period of time these neurons also have uh, a kind of an uh, no go kind of a system where they do not get excited after a period of time they, they show this uh, the dull state after at that point of time and so they cannot excite after a number of excitations and so that is what uh, happens and so you are not able to remember anything. So, why because encoding variability best to encode in a variety of ways to attach a wider variety of memory cues to the material spacing practice allows you to have more variability. What will happen is that if you break the lesson into several parts and start learning it there will be so many other cues because as you uh, take breaks and you come back learning the context the surrounding will change as a number of surrounding cues will be there the chances are that even if you uh, do not remember one part of information there are several other parts you will remember. But if let us say in one context you are learning and if something goes wrong if you forget something from the context the whole information will go away. So, it is like learning things in in in, in uh, small uh, uh, chunks and when that happens with as the you start learning in different different chunks the environment keeps on changing the number of changes of the environment will give you more number of cues more the number of cues more the chances of remembering and that so that is what really happens and that is what spacing effect is all about. So, we were also discussing about something called the different kinds of memory and so that is what I showed to you. So, there are several subdivisions of memory as I said there is something called semantic memory <laughs> which is the memory for general knowledge. So, it stores uh, most information into it, it stores information like uh, the facts arithmetic rule, it uh, stores information like how what is the meaning of bigger, what is the meaning of smaller, it stores information like what is the capital of Finland, what is the capital of United States, who was the first US president, who was the first Indian president, who uh, is the only lady president uh, prime minister of India or things like where is America from here or uh, uh, what is a wheel cart, what is a cow that kind of information is general knowledge information because these are something which you need to know and which are which are facts which is there. So, also information is like where will the sun rise, when will the sun set and that kind of information. Now, episodic memory are those which have events or which remember events. So, this is things like uh, my uh, 12 class farewell, my first birthday party, uh, my first fling which was there, uh, my first day at school, my first day at college, uh, those kind of things, my first party, the most amazing party in my life and all those highlights of your uh, highlight events of your memory or of your life is what this episodic memory is. It is like an episode, so it is like a film. Whereas, uh, semantic memory is like a text, so it has knowledge into it, but no event related to it. Episodic knowledge or episodic memory is like a event, so it is like a film. So, you have all the sounds and lights and everything into it and that is what an episodic memory will look like, but semantic memory are bare facts. So, it is like a newspaper. So, a uh, uh, very uh, crude comparison is episodic memory is like television, but then uh, the semantic memory is like a newspaper, but then when I say episodic and semantic you do have to remember that episodic memory has to have semantic memory into it, but semantic memory need not necessarily have episodic ep uh, events. For example, when I say uh, uh, what is an apple define an apple. 
Now, when you define me an apple, you do not really need to think about an apple or when you saw your first apple or your first episode with an apple. You can say that it is a fruit, it is red, green, blue in color, it is not blue in color, but then red or uh, green in color or uh, it tastes like this, that is the kind of information that you relate. But nowhere along the line do you have to think your first encounter with the apple. You do not have to think when you met your first apple or when you ate your first apple or where you learned the word apple. But in episodic memory, you have to have semantic memory embedded into it. For example, I say your first birthday. When I say your first birthday, there is a schema, there is a uh, basic event that you think about. So, what happened in your first birthday? So, in your first birthday, you might have got a toy or uh, you might have got a certain kind of cake for that you have to know what is a cake what does it taste like what is the meaning of the word cake and what is the meaning of the word toy and what kind of toy so with movie you have newspaper items also or facts and knowledge also but in a newspaper you do not have these events into it so newspapers are static and tv is dynamic and that is the difference between what a semantic and episodic memory is so, basically most uh, and then the semantic and episodic memory are what are called explicit memory, because when you remember it, you are conscious about it, you consciously uh, uh, think about it. So, when you think about apple, you consciously are searching your long term memory for what an apple is and if I ask you to differentiate between what an apple is and what an orange is or what a mango is you consciously do this task, you ask your long term memory what is an apple, what is an orange and what is a mango and differentiate between it. So, you be are conscious, you are aware of what you are doing or if I ask you to uh, tell me uh, your farewell how it went or let us say your first day in college, then you will relate events of what happened, you came here, whom do you meet for the first time, what are the events which took place, how it unfolded and so on and so forth. You can briefly tell me like a movie. So, you are aware, you are interacting with that particular thing and so both of these are conscious in nature. Whereas, there is a kind of memory which is called procedural memory which is implicit in nature. What, how it is implicit in nature? So, things like how do you ride a bicycle? If I ask you how do you ride a bicycle or 21 days to bicycle or 7 hours to teaching bicycle, most of you will not be able to tell me. So, most people have tried this in my class and I have asked them how do you ride a bicycle, most people say you get on to it and start paddling, but then how do you get on to it and start paddling that is very that seems very funny or some people say you sit on it and you, and you start riding, so if you sit on it on a static bicycle it will fall. So, basically then there are steps to it, but you cannot vocalize it, you cannot go ahead and relate it and that is the problem with it. So, procedural memory or non-conscious you do not interact, you do that. So, bicycling is something which you do, but you are not aware of it and a popular joke is that somebody said someone when he was riding a bicycle of look the tire on your uh, back of your bicycle is not moving, he saw and he fell. Why? Because he became conscious as soon as he became conscious the bicycle from the bicycle it fell and that is what it is all about in implicit memory because you are not consciously aware as soon as you become consciously aware then problem arises. So, these are the subdivisions of long term uh, memory and so also uh, how we will discuss about these memory types in the upcoming lecture. There are also, so as we discuss these explicit and implicit memories, the explicit memories are called declarative in nature, they hold facts, information and ideas and then there are procedural memories, they, uh, uh, they look at things like uh, how things are done, uh, how a particular thing happens and so on and so forth. So, basically this declarative procedural differences is in terms of explicitly or uh, explicity of it. Uh, so, uh, whether you are aware of it or not and so this is another distinction which is there in long term memory the procedural versus declarative type whether a memory is conscious or not. And within the declarative as I said you will have three type uh, sorry two types you will have the semantic type which is facts and knowledge and you will have the episodic type which is basically the events of your life and within the procedural you will have classical conditioning. So, those things which you learn from classical conditioning you do not know. So, classical conditioning is a way of learning in which something is given to you. So, it is called reinforcement induced learning. So, you do a particular behavior because 
something is given to you. For example, think of those uh, chips packet which say that buy it because something comes free with it. So, free is the reward that you get and because of free you are buying something and that is classical conditioning. So, you do not think too much and that is procedural in nature or you have habits. Habits are also procedural in nature because if you have a habit of let us say I have a habit of uh, scratching my head. If that is my habit I do not think about doing it or I have some other habit which is there. So, habits are mostly non-conscious forms of memory you do not think about it. And similarly, the third form is called priming. In priming also you do not consciously think about that the information is provided to you. So, basically consciously information is not given to you some kind of information brief facts about something is provided to you and that facts help you into later perception is what is called uh, priming. And so, these are the three types of memories which are out there. Now, there is a, a level of processing uh, framework which is um, uh, which has been used or which has been uh, named in addition to the Atkinson and Schrieffen model. And so, what is this level of processing framework? This level of processing framework says that there is no one store uh, two stores of memory. So, the Atkinson and Schrieffen model says about three stores of memory. So, I have a short term store, I have a sensory register, I have a short term store and I have a long term store into memory. So, three stores to be looked at. And so, what happens here in this case is that there are three stores and three process which makes you basically go ahead and uh, process information. And so, there are processing systems or there are processing uh, um, uh, process which moves information. But then there is a conceptualization of memory which says that it is not three stores which stores memory, there is one store and that is called the level of processing store. So, what the level of processing store says is that information there is one single information processing uh, store, but then what differentiates different kinds of memory is what is the kind of processing that is applied. And so, they talk about two kinds of processing, one is called the elaborate rehearsal. So, what is the kind of rehearsal that you do with information that will decide how you have processed an information and the other is called the maintenance rehearsal. So, in maintenance rehearsal what happens is an information is basically processed or it is basically uh, re, re, uh, it's basically rehearsed for just the maintenance purpose. So, remembering a phone number uh, from a telephone conversation for dialing it further at some point of time is basically maintenance rehearsal because you do not want anything in future with that number and so you do not uh, process it at a deeper level, but elaborate rehearsal is basically processing something at a deeper level. So, let us say uh, uh, somebody gives you a phone number and this person uh, you do not want to remember for the rest of your life or any part of your life. And so, what you will do is you will uh, dial these numbers. So, next time you are dialing a uh, call center or somebody for help which you would not want further in, in life that is basically maintenance rehearsal. So, you will repeat the numbers till the point of time that you dial it. Once you get connected to it, the number is of no meaning to you. But let us say that in your first day in college, a beautiful girl approaches you and gives you a number and now you are immediately head over heels for this person. You remember that number. Each number is now related to a meaning, is provided a meaning. For example, flowers, this, that, all kind of things are associated with each number which is out there. And so, that number you might never forget and that is what is called elaborate rehearsal. So, elaborate rehearsal is a process where you attach meaning, a uh, kind of a meaning which makes information uh, retrieval easy. So, more processing you do, uh, the more uh, elaborate rehearsal it acts out to be. And so, basically to, to prove that this kind of a system exists, participants were told to answer questions as quickly as possible on words which are shown on a screen. So, for example, the word which is shown here is screen. So, three type of questions were asked. One is what is the capital letter? Is it in capital letter? What does it rhyme with? And does it fit with a sentence? For example, the dash jogged over the mailman. So, three type of questions were asked quickly. They had to to relate this question. So, word was shown to people and they were asked to retrieve back these kind of questions. What do you think happened? So, later on a surprise recall test, participants showed better memory for words that have fit in a sentence. 
why they remembered better because this the word then was processed for meaning. So, the uh, dash uh, jumped over the fence or jumped over my friend or jumped over to meet me is actually the word dog and so when it is pr uh, processed for the word d o g which now has a meaning. So, when we are asking how many capital letters were there or whether it is capital or not you are not making meaning of the word d o g or if I even if I am asking questions like what the, does it rhyme with frog or not? I am not interpreting it in a meaning level, I am interpreting it in an acoustic level, but when I put it in a sentence, it has to mean something, the sentence need a completion and for that the word has to have a meaning and that is why it is recalled better. So, better recall because deeper processing for these type of questions which force participants to think about the meaning of a particular word and that is what I have been saying. So, this kind of and so the dog in the last sentence had went through something called elaborate rehearsal. Elaborate rehearsal is a system in level of processing which says that information if they are processed for a deeper meaning for some kind of meaning they go through elaborate rehearsal, but information like what whether the word was in capitals or not or whether the first letter was capital or not required maintenance rehearsal because you do not need to process the word for some kind of deeper meaning. Now, a feature of memory that we uh, have to talk about is called reconstructive memory. As we saw long term memory is generally reco uh, reconstructive in nature, which means that it, it suffers from several inaccuracies. Whenever you store something an exact replica of that does not come back, there is always malleability in it, there is always inaccuracies in it and that is what is called reconstruction of memory. So, basically retelling of stories leads to distortions of what is remembered and so this kind of reconstructive memory was testing of reconstruction of memory or that memory is inaccurate were tested long back by Frederick Bartlett and what Frederick Bartlett did was he wanted to test how these reconstruction work in uh, terms of everyday life process. So, what he did was he gave a story called the war of the ghost to a couple of people to read and then later gave, gave them some time to uh, recall back the story. Now, when people recall back the story they changed the story according to their own biases according to what they wanted to. So, most of the items in the story was there, but then the story was somehow changed in a manner and this is called reconstruction and this is the first evidence of reconstruction. So, the kind of memory that you have the memory system that we talk about is highly inaccurate in nature and it is highly reconstructive which means that only gist of information is remembered. So, when you see a scene or when you hear a particular uh, audio of something or a movie or this happens with us also. If you, if you go to see a movie and when you come back from the movie and I ask you what did you see in a movie, you will be able to tell in 5 or 6 sentence what you saw in a movie. Now, the movie was 3 hours which means that you have to remember each part of it, but that does not happen. What you tend to remember is the gist of it and that is why memories are highly reconstructive. Also, the way you will describe the memory base is based on your expectation. So, if you expected a memory to be action, the you will highlight the action part and you will not highlight some other part and so that is basically called reconstruction. So, eyewitness memory is subjected to distortion when leading questions are asked. So, there is, there is a um, phenomena in reconstruction of memory which is related to something called eyewitness memory. So, whenever an accident happens people who are witness to the accident, accident are called eyewitnesses and so it has been found that people who relate accidents or relate events they have highly inaccurate memories. So, uh, what happened or what could be done is that if, if certain questions are asked in a frame in such a way that uh, they uh, they give them a leading answer or they give them some kind of information they tend to change their memory or reconstruct memory. For example, in a, in an experiment which uh, Loftus did where they showed people uh, two cars collide with each other with certain speed and later on they were asked certain questions, questions like did another car pass the red dot or the stop sign or the sign were actually yell sign a participant later falsely recognized stop signs 59 percent of the time. Because what happened is that in the initial picture Loftus did not show the uh, there was no sign of the stop sign and this is basically something which Loftus added on to the participants. And since the question give them uh, the questions which are asked is very leading question it matched their schema, it matched the way they saw the incident that led them to make 
false recognitions. So, basically eyewitness testimony the facts to be re remembered is that recall is not an exact replica of the original event. What really happens is that original events are not recalled and so there is always a replica of that. Also recall a construction recall is a construction which is rebuilt from various sources. So, there are different different sources something we can remember from experience with matter into it. So, whenever you are recalling something back it is basically a reconstruction is basically reconfiguration of several facts and that can come from several sources it could be something which you actually saw, something which you actually think you saw, something actually which you actually know and so something that which something somebody else said all this information will add up to form the recall. Often fit memories into existing beliefs or schemas. So, there are certain schemas which is there and so memories tend to fit into the schemas. A schema is basically a container. So, when I say a uh, classroom the classroom schema is basically the idea that there will be one teacher when student uh, some students they are talking to each other a class board and this is an expectation. So, schema is basically this kind of a framework which is out there and so when something fits into the schema it is basically easily processed. So, if I say that a uh, student came uh, to the class with a red uh, shirt on it is acceptable, but when I say a student uh, beside the student in the class cow was sitting not possible because as not in a schema of a class and so this kind of a thing is there. So, when uh, things fit into the schema, so it is perfectly ok to say somebody came with a pink shirt or a pink uh, trouser to the class that is perfectly ok and so people will believe it and that fits a schema and so people uh, that is how eyewitness testimony is basically manipulated. So, schema is a mental representation of an object seen or event. Example schema of a countryside may include green grass, hills, farm and so that is what I was trying to explain to you. Similarly, there is something called scripts which are mental organization of events in time. So, what is a script? A script is how mental uh, the how things occur. For example, let us say dinner. Now, dinner is a script because then you expect something to happen in sequence. For example, you go to a dinner and you start with the first course which is the soup generally or some other hot beverage which is out there. Then there is a beverage to follow, then there is a first course, a second course, a third course followed by sweet and then there is an ending with an ice cream. So, you expect a time related fact to happen or traveling in a uh, in, in a bus or a car and so you expect a certain sequence of event to happen and this sequence of event is what is called a script. So, example is a classroom script come into the class sit down talk to a friend bell rings instructor begins to speak and so on and so forth. So, this is a script of this particular thing. Memory distortions. So, memory can be distorted as people try to fit new information into existing schema. So, basically if as I said if I say that a person came in a blue trouser or red trouser now you expect that in a classroom that can happen so it will fit. But if I say a person came uh, uh, who was not wearing trousers or not wearing anything in a classroom that is not possible and so that cannot be accepted. So, giving misleading information after an event causes subjects to unknowingly distort their memories and incorporate new memories into uh, uh, people and this is called the distortion of memory or misleading information and this really happens. So, as I have explained to you the Loftus experiment that we are discussing, let us look at what the Loftus experiment was all about. So, subjects were shown a video of an accident between two cars. So, this is two cars, there is an accident to it and some subjects were asked questions like how fast were the cars, cars going when they smashed into each other and for the other question people were asked how far the fast going. Now, the key word is smashed here and the smashed means that they not actually uh, touched each other and went, they actually went ahead and uh, went on a head on collision and so that is the keyword here and so this kind of an experiment when it was done with people when it was asked how fast the car is going when smashed was used most people had a average rating of 41 miles per hour, but when it was a contacted word was used the speed came down and so this is how false memory is generated in the loftus paradigm. Two more types of memory which are there in uh, long term memory is the autobiographical memory and the false memory uh, sorry the flash bulb memory we will look into this one by one. So, basically what is autobiographical memory? It is a real world memory which are more durable than laboratory memories. So, basically autobiographical memory is a memory of 
yourself. So, what do you do or what are your personal memories or what autobiographical memories are. So, some items are forgotten because they are hard to distinguish from other similar memories. So, autobiographical memories generally are memories that people have about themselves. So, your own memory of what happened uh, in your life, how it happened, what events took place and those kind of memories are called autobiographical memories. Now, single event memories are often combined into extended summarized events. So, uh, as you progress in life, uh, what would happen is that one memory could be connected with so many other memories and so the memory gets inflating. And so, your memory of who you are as a child as you grow up this adds on to it with several other factors and so what happens is several other memories um, combined with it and then you see your childhood as a particular thing. But when you are a child and when you, what memory you have and when you become an adult and what memory of your childhood happens or what you remember is basically what is called autobiographical memory. So, rare actions are more likely to be recalled than frequent actions. So, those features which are rare which never happen too often are what are remembered in more in autobiographical memory. Another kind of memory which is out there is called the flash bulb memory and what is this kind of memory? So, this kind of memory was um, mostly uh, related to emotional events. And so, flash bulb memory was popularized why because uh, it was believed that certain events in your life uh, create certain flashes or create certain emotional events and uh, when a memory is stacked to that that is what is called flash bulb memory for example uh, uh, e memories of what happened if you are a cricket fan uh, where were you if i ask you this question where were you when india won uh, the 2011 world cup so most people who are familiar with this idea uh, of or who, who like cricket or cricket fans will have very good idea of where they were. And so, this India winning was a flash bulb item which basically me meant that it, uh, it created a, a situation, it created a thing which was an event which was emotional in nature. And so, most people then go ahead and encode this particular memory or encode their own uh, living, their own context with this kind of a memory and so these are what is called uh, false memory. Now, two things to remember that this flash bulb memory are generally highly inaccurate in nature and they are uh, related to or they are more prone to forgetting and distortions. So, flash bulb memory for example, when you went to a shopping trip with your mom and your cousin somehow you wandered away in a store and get lost. A security guard found you and you were reunited with your mom about an hour later. This is flash bulb memory where this event was so emotional that you actually thought that uh, whatever you thought during that period of time, whatever you felt become flash bulb memory. Now, this event could have never happened, but after repeated question 29 percent of people recalled having having this for ep episode. So, this kind of a structure was given people were shown this kind of a sentence and they were asked to remember this sentence and when a recall was done and when people were again shown this there was this particular information again and again people were shown this uh, bit of information again again they falsely recognized that this could have happened and they remembered this flash bulb memory. And in this case this is the 9 11 attack on United States. So, most people do remember where they were during the 9 11 attack and it is what is the false well, uh, false uh, memories all about. So, generally two things about this memory it is highly inaccurate and then it is uh, related uh, generally related to uh, inaccuracies and forgetting and distortions. Now, uh, there is a methodological uh, uh, way to create false memories. Now, we, we saw how eyewitness testimony is one way to do false memories, but there is another way to uh, create false memories and that is called the Dees, Rodriger and McDermott paradigm to show that memories are inaccurate and to show the fact that false memories or memories that never occur can actually be created and embedded into people's mind. Now, for the DRM paradigm a list like this is given to people. Now, these lists are semantically the words in this list are semantically related to each other for example, dark, dream, pillow, nap, night, white. And I am very sure that when you look at this list you do know or it, it seems to you that all these words are highly semantically related or highly connected to the word sleep. It seems like